Video number four in my series on Chinese electric vehicle manufacturers. In each of the previous videos, there have been some common themes. China's the largest electric vehicle market in the world. The competition there is moving fast and furious, and there may just be too many good competitors for them all to succeed. That's why some are starting to export vehicles to other markets like Europe, where early on they're finding modest success and then I would end each video looking at the manufacturer to see if they can pull off bringing an electric vehicle and selling it in the US market. Except there's something I didn't mention. You can already buy a Chinese made electric vehicle in the US and it's this company that did it first. That's who we're gonna talk about today. Li Shufu is the founder and current chairman of Geely Group. They started making refrigerators in the mid-1980s, purchased a failing state-run motorcycle manufacturer in the mid-1990s, developed their first four-wheel vehicle just a few years later. Geely Auto had their IPO on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in 2004 and began to promote itself on the global stage in the following years. During the 2000s, there was nothing remarkable about Geely vehicles. Like the Chinese auto industry in general at the time, they produced simple, affordable, gas-powered vehicles, often resembling designs from more established Western automakers. 2008, when things started to change for them. At the time, Ford was trying to avoid going down the same path as GM and Chrysler into filing for bankruptcy protection. Geely made an offer to purchase Volvo cars from Ford. Ford owned Volvo, Jaguar, and Land Rover, but was never able to turn around those companies. Instead, they floundered, trying to take advantage of platform sharing with Ford without each brand losing its identity. Like, well, you know, the Jaguar X-Type, remember that vehicle? Volvo used the Ford EUCD platform as the basis for a whole lot of vehicles. It helped, but it really didn't turn things around for them. In 2009, during the worst of the Great Recession, Ford named Geely as their preferred bidder for Volvo. The sale was completed in 2010. Volvo, the iconic Swedish car brand, was now owned by a Chinese car company little known to the rest of the world. Fast forward to current day and you'll notice a bit of a pattern. Geely has a number of brands in its portfolio that have a history outside of China. So they have some brand recognition in other markets. Those vehicles include Geely Auto, of course, Volvo Cars, Polestar, which began life as the performance brand of Volvo. It is now a separately traded Swedish company with operational ties to its parents, Volvo and Geely. Link & Co. is a Chinese-Swedish company that utilizes vehicles from the rest of the brands. Lotus was acquired in 2017. It's another example of a legendary European brand name that was struggling to turn things around under its previous ownership. Its previous owner was the Malaysian company called Proton, which is now partially owned by Geely. Zeker is a premium Chinese EV only brand established to go up against the lights of Neo and Tesla, plus several other brands. Not all of the brands mentioned are wholly owned by Geely. Some are joint ventures, but once you become part of the Geely family, they all tend to borrow heavily from their EV components and platform sharing. Let's pause a minute after that long list of brand names. Now, it's great from a business standpoint that they can share technology across that many vehicles. It helps with the business case. But history has shown that it's not easy to juggle that many different brands. General Motors struggled during the later years to keep brand differentiation across models that shared so many components. That's why Geely can't let all these vehicles compete in the same market. If they're just going to focus all their attention on the China market, eventually they're just going to cannibalize sales from one another. That's why they have to look to other markets for some of these brand names, potentially setting up a headquarters in, I don't know, Sweden. How about a factory in South Carolina? And for entry-level EVs, you can still make them in China and import them into those countries. Let's start with Polestar and then work Volvo into the discussion. The Polestar 1 was a plug-in hybrid electric, although the brand quickly declared that it would be 100% electric going forward. What we need to focus on is the Polestar 2, 3, 4, and 5. I started off this video talking about a Chinese-made EV that you can buy in America. 
It's the Polestar 2. Ta-da! Assembled in China and built on the compact modular architecture that underpins other Geely and Volvo EVs. It's sold in many markets around the world, including America. And personally, I, I really like this car. I like it better than the Model 3 and, and kind of better than the Model Y. The interior quality is much better. Navigation and entertainment is based on Google Automotive Services. It's a really good EV. In the U.S., Polestars are sold in a separate dealer network, not the same showrooms as Volvo's. Sales of Polestar 2 have been slow in the U.S., and I'll give you my opinion why. First, the dealer network is still very small. Second, it's seen as a four-door sedan, not an SUV, and we like our SUVs. It's also, the brand awareness is still much lower than Volvo or other brands. They need to advertise more. I would expect that they ramp that up as they have other EV models come to their showroom. And lastly, it's a little pricey. Polestar wants to be positioned more like Audi than Volkswagen. There's another thing to mention about the price of the Polestar 2, and that's U.S. tariffs. Chinese-made EVs entering Europe get slapped with a 10% tariff. That's what the importer needs to pay, and presumably it makes the product more expensive to sell unless the importer wants to sell it at a loss. The U.S. had a lower tariff than that of only 2.5%, but it was raised temporarily by the Trump administration as part of a trade dispute with China. However, that additional 25% added was never negotiated away, and the Biden administration likes it just the way it is. As a result, Polestar must be selling each vehicle at a loss that they import from China. But they have plans to fix this. I'll talk about that in a minute. Polestar 4 is a compact crossover with a fastback rear glass. It goes up against the Tesla Model Y, although it is a little bigger. Unlike many other Polestar and Volvo models, this one has a landscape-oriented center display. It's built on the SEA1 electric vehicle architecture. It has much in common with other members of the family, but the thing that got the most attention when this vehicle was revealed was the rear window, or I should say lack thereof. The smaller Polestar 2 has lousy rearward visibility, and apparently the Polestar 4 was going to be just as bad, maybe worse, so instead they utilize a virtual rearview mirror connected to a rear-mounted camera with an excellent view behind the vehicle. This crossover will be made in China. The Polestar 5 is an executive sedan version of the Polestar 4, built on the same platform. Likely, it will be assembled in the same plant in China, and it too gave up the rear view window in favor of a virtual mirror. This is where I feel their numerical naming falls apart. The Polestar 3 is a mid-size crossover SUV with a traditional rear roofline. It's slightly larger and more premium than the 4, it rides on Polestar Volvo's latest platform called SPA2. It's a dedicated electric vehicle platform that will also be used for the Volvo EX90. The X90 will be a three-row all-electric crossover, while the Polestar 3 will only have two rows and is a little more performance-oriented with standard all-wheel drive. The Polestar 3 and the Volvo EX90 will both be manufactured in two locations, China and in the U.S. That plant in South Carolina is going to play a key role for their North American strategy. Since 2018, Volvo has been making the S60 sedan there, which is an odd product to make in the U.S. Sedans uh, just plummeted in popularity in North America in general. Production has been significantly under capacity, making for an unprofitable operation. They began exporting the S60 from the plant there in 2019. However, their plans recently started to make more sense. The U.S. has a provision called Duty Drawback Program. It allows Volvo and Polestar to take credit for all those S60s they've been making in the U.S. and exporting overseas and offset the tariffs that they're paying on vehicles that they import from places like China. You can call it a loophole, but the logic makes sense. Volvo is being rewarded for making things in the U.S., creating jobs, and exporting them to other countries. As an incentive, they get forgiven for importing things from outside the U.S. They will continue to generate credits once they start exporting the X EX90s and the Polestar 3s from South Carolina. 
Polestar will then be able to use those offsets on the two, four, and five coming in from China. Volvo will also be able to use those offsets for an upcoming affordable EV. Volvo has been steadily transitioning to electric mobility for several years. They offer plug-in hybrid powertrains alongside gas engines. They offer the XC40 as either a gas or a full battery electric. Their newer products, though, are more compelling and designed to be electric from the ground up. Volvo kind of surprised people with the reveal of the EX30. It's a small EV hatchback with less than 300 miles of range. So why all the fuss? Well, it kind of does everything really well, at least on paper. It's built on the Geely SEA2 platform, which offers very good technology. I like the looks minimalistic with that Volvo boxiness. Power and acceleration is way better than expected. It will be assembled in China. And for the U.S. market, Volvo's credits will allow them to sell it for a starting price of $35,000. Tesla has been working on its entry-level Model Q for a while. And this is the kind of vehicle they need to beat. They need to beat it in price and technology. A smart, premium EV with very good tech for not a lot of money. At the high end, I already mentioned the EX90, an all-electric three-row SUV. Interesting safety technology in that vehicle. Volvo is looking to deploy advanced driver assistance systems that put more focus on safety than just technology because, well, that's, that's what Volvos do. Its pilot assist system can keep you centered in the lane and warn you of oncoming vehicles. Interior sensors monitor the driver for distracted driving situations or if you accidentally leave someone in the vehicle. The EX90 follows a trend that not everybody loves. It involves placing a LiDAR sensor along the top of the windshield. That's the sensor responsible for those cool rainbow 3D map images. They're far from the only company doing this, and it will help the vehicle achieve SAE Level 3 autonomy sometime in 2025 with an over-the-air software update. By the way, if you're not familiar with the SAE levels of driving, I did a video on that. Check that out on the subject or tap that subscribe button so it shows up in your feed. So if Polestar is more performance oriented and Volvo is more safety oriented, that leaves Zeker to be the brand most focused on autonomy. The Zeker X is a premium compact SUV. It's built on the same SEA2 platform as the Volvo EX30. So some of the specs may look the same because it's sharing a lot of equipment under the hood. Made in China, it started to take pre-orders in some European markets. It's not trying to win on price. It's positioned as a premium EV. In this respect, it faces the same challenges as Neo and Xpeng in Europe, building brand awareness and its sales and support network. The Zeker 001 is, wait for it, based on the SEA1 platform like the Polestar 5. It's a shooting brake, not a traditional sedan. It was designed in Sweden, but assembly and most of the engineering is done in China. Zeker will offer a hyper-performance version called the FR. As I like to say, it takes this car into stupid fast territory. They claim it'll be a hundredth of a second faster than the Tesla Model S Plaid, and explained all the conditions for how that number was recorded. Quad motor, over 1,200 horsepower. On the more practical side, it is an 800-volt architecture that can recharge in 15 minutes with the right charging equipment. The Zeker 009 is built on that same platform. Styling credit is given to two European designers. On, on the inside, I, I see that. But on the outside, whoa. <laughs> I mean... That's a Chinese minivan. I mean, it's cool for the right person. I mean, just imagine dropping your kids off at school with that vehicle. Geely sees themselves as somewhat of an open source EV platform. They're willing to work with many different partners. Waymo partnered with Zeker on this concept for a robo taxi. Built on their SEAM, M for mobility, it features a low floor for easy entry and no steering wheel because it's capable of level four and five autonomy. In production, Zeker partnered with Mobileye, formerly part of Intel, to utilize their supervision system on the 001 and 009. Like Tesla's FSD, it relies heavily on camera sensing, 
although it uses higher definition cameras than Tesla's current hardware three. What else is Geely into? They increased their stake into the British luxury car maker Austin Martin, although Austin Martin recently announced a partnership with Lucid to advance their transition to electric vehicles. Geely now also has a majority ownership of Lotus Cars. Lotus still makes a light gas-powered sports car, the Amira, but their upcoming lineup looks much different. They've announced the Avia. It's a stupid fast, stupid powerful hypercar. It's still made in England. A mature prototype of that car has been rolling around test tracks for like four years, and now they claim that production models are being built. But the car that has everyone talking is the Lotus Electra. On the positive side, it's really fast. Advanced 800 volt, all electric architecture, high tech with LiDAR, cameras, radar sensors. It's a crossover SUV, so they're much more likely to sell in volume than a two-seater sports car. On the negative side, can you really call it a Lotus? It's, it's heavy because it's an electric vehicle, but also because it's a fairly large SUV. The founder of Lotus famously said, to simplify, then add lightness. This crossover is neither simple nor light. It will be assembled in China and rides on the SEA S platform. There will also be a GT version coming out later that will compete with the Porsche Taycan. I said Geely wants to be kind of an open source platform for electric vehicles. In 2019, Mercedes announced a partnership with Geely to transform the European smart brand to electric mobility. The results of this JV are some very competent Chinese made affordable EVs with names where you're expected to say hashtag before the number. Wow, that's that's great. Geely bought their way into British culture, turning the London taxi company into the London electric vehicle company. The classic and functional vehicles are now powered by an electric motor that gets recharged by a range extending petrol engine. This makes it a series plug-in hybrid like the BMW i3 with its range extender option. London has implemented an ultra low emission zone where vehicles that do not meet strict tailpipe emission standards are fined when entering the inner part of the city with a ban on combustion engine vehicles, the inevitable next step. Link and Co, not to be confused with Lincoln, is more of a mobility ownership experience than a car brand, allowing mobility subscriptions and all-inclusive leasing options. The vehicles themselves are based on other vehicles in the Geely family. Geely and tech giant Baidu announced the Jai Yu brand. It's a premium, intelligent technology-defined brand, yet another vehicle brand, this one targeted at Neo and Xpeng, Continuing the theme of being open to partnerships, Geely, Renault, and oil giant Aramco recently announced a JV to develop internal combustion powertrains. This would transfer all of the current gas and diesel engine production under one company. This could become the role model for other companies to follow. With everyone's R&D budget shifting to define electric powertrains, it would make sense for competitors to come together and share costs for the remaining internal combustion engine vehicles. I should mention that Geely also makes vehicles under the Geely brand, and most of them are still internal combustion engines for now. Geometry is an EV-only sub-brand to help them gain market share for more affordable electric vehicles in China. If you want a commercial vehicle, they make light, medium, and heavy-duty trucks, most of their lineups are battery electric vehicles, although they do offer a few that run on alternative fuels like liquefied natural gas and biofuels. They also recently raised $600 million to expand sales into Europe. Geely Holdings includes two companies that make motorcycles, two companies working on vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Geely is involved in aerospace. Polestar is coming out with its own smartphone in China. I kid you not, about the only thing they don't make is a pickup. Nope, they make a pickup too. Geely recently introduced another brand called Radar. They make the RD6 all-electric pickup. Right now, it's only mentioned for the China market. It looks kind of like the Honda Ridgeline, 
that vehicle never really sold well in the U.S. It was seen as being too much like a crossover. Plus, they would have to deal with the U.S. tariff that they wanted to bring it to America. But it's just another example of Geely's seemingly endless product lineup. I know, that was a lot of information, and I barely scratched the surface on some of it. With so many different brand names and joint ventures, it's hard to get a real good grasp on how well Geely Auto is doing as a company. In their latest disclosure, for the first half of 2023, revenue is up significantly. The company itself is profitable, driven mostly by its older but highly profitable combustion engine vehicles. Polestar is a separately traded company, and as an EV-only startup, its stock has struggled like many others. Zeker is rumored to be looking to go at an IPO later this year. Well, that's my overview of Geely. On the negative side, I think they're a little bit reckless with how they're managing their business. They've got a lot of different brands that they're gonna have to manage, and history has shown it's not easy to keep that brand differentiation when you're sharing components across a wide range of vehicles. I think they also lack focus. And look at their autonomous vehicle projects. They've got developments going on with Waymo, they've got Mobileye, and now they've got a new joint venture with Baidu, who's also in the autonomous vehicle space. Each one of those requires engineers and resources. It's not easy to juggle that many different projects. On the positive side, they've got brand names that are very recognizable outside of China. That's a huge advantage for them going into a new market with a brand name that people are at least somewhat familiar with. They've also developed a unique way of dealing with the high U.S. tariff, at least partially offsetting that barrier to entry into the U.S. market. And by most accounts, their EVs are very, very good. So that's something to build on. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing so you get the whole series. Thanks for watching.